Welcome to Chew On This. You are about to enter a discussion on how to actually live out faith in Christ in the reality of our messy lives. This discussion comes from our Wednesday night crew, the pastoral preaching notes, and the live large group discussion that these notes prompted, something we like to call a community-based learning experience. Come on, chew on this with us. What is it like when you're left in charge? I mean, you know, like in charge, in charge, where they come one by one, group by group, hordes by hordes, and they want you to make the final deciding decision, that that final decision where it's just done. What would it be like if you were left in charge? On this episode of Chew on This, we are looking at the beginning of the answer to that question, as we are in week four of Who Is This Man Called Peter? This conversation happened live on Wednesday night, June 30th, here at the Forest Lake campus, campus of Maranatha, and it was exciting because we had to stop the conversation, and people didn't want to go home because we weren't done discussing what Peter is up to. Really excited to have this conversation with you all as you enjoy this episode of Chew on This. I want to let you know that all of my notes, my conglomeration, there are an extra bunch. There's only, and I guess there's only 45 pages of notes this week, but specifically looking at pods of notes connected to these different opportunities of leadership that we get to examine today as Peter goes through the step-by-step process of walking as the leader now that Jesus has ascended to heaven. He gets to test what it is like walking on feet that he's never really stood on before. So Pastor Robin, I am excited for us to walk through this today on this episode because a little extra excited because last night was like, oh my God, do we have to go home? Oh, don't we have another hour? Let's just call Pastor Tina and Pastor Gail in the back of the building and say, hey, hang on to our kids. We have some conversation that isn't done because there isn't any way we can pick up the conversation. Well, there isn't because of the 4th of July celebration. We don't meet on Wednesday night next week, but that following week, two weeks from now, we'll be on to some other topic of, you know, fascination. But it was lovely watching people not leave. I finished praying and nobody moved. It was awesome. The uh, the discussion that came up, the questions, it was almost like you could feel the wheels turning of, oh, um, hey, wait a minute, what about this? And I just remembered that. And even as we were closing up, to leave for the day in the hallway in the office that chitter chatter was still going on because all of this stuff was still bubbling up. And I just appreciated this facet of Peter's life because honestly, I had never looked at him from this particular lens before. And yeah, the, the, Thoughts were popping last night, and honestly, they have continued for me, too. I have much more, not that I didn't have compassion for Peter before, but seeing him as a new leader, because, I mean, we've had the privilege of uh, serving in, you know, different (laughs) Mm -hmm. ministry opportunities. Uh, I think particularly our, our wonderful women's retreat for years. And, you know, when you're engaged in the shoot... You are relying on the Holy Spirit's wisdom right in the moment. Yes. And, you know, these different circumstances present themselves. And seeing Peter in a moment that is familiar to yes. us, yes. It, uh, it was really very cool. I have truly enjoyed all of this in-depth study we've done over this past year or past two years, it would be looking at the different apostles and, and going through and finding what information is out there on each one, and some there's barely anything. But there, there seems to be this wonderful plethora of information, even though Peter has, he's in the Gospels, he's in Acts, and then First and Second Peter, and he's mentioned maybe here and there in Galatians, because that's where Paul talks about confronting him. But we just get this wonderful glimpse, and is it around Acts 14, Acts 12, I believe, Peter kind of disappears, and Paul takes over as far as the focus of Luke's writing. And 
I wonder where did he go and what was he up to? So we get this opportunity to see the beginning of what it is like getting his leadership soul, uh, the, what would you say, the, the big daddy leadership, this big kahuna leadership where he is there and he's the, the buck stops here type of thing. And what does that, that look like from the perspective of this lens looking back in history? Mm -hmm. And I know I'm a history buff and I truly enjoy mm -hmm. his studying history, but it, you always wonder who's in the listening audience or who's in the congregation, who's in the group last night, the nice crew. Are they going to find this fascinating? Because some of these pieces of information that gets that really make your brain go, da -da 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 do not make other people's brains popcorn like that. Right. <laughs> but right. it was fun watching lots of brains go, pop, 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 pop. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I love that one. Hey, wait, what about this? Exactly. That lovely being able to have an interrupting conversation is invited on Wednesday night in this adult class so we can learn together. And I found myself so grateful for your study and thanking the Lord for those in the body of Christ somewhere along the course of line who are imparting to us cultural context. You know, we know yes. in hermeneutical studies how to interpret the Bible, context is king. And the Bible is just so rich, and someone giving us a glimpse into Middle Eastern culture and what you've learned with the patronage system and all of this other kind of stuff has really... Um, helped me in my perspective of understanding a little bit better what they were going through in a time frame that I, of course, don't have access to. So, so yes. grateful for all of the work of those who have come before us to yes. make all of that available for us. I, I agree. I agree. So with that being stated, we're going to be looking at somewhere in the dates of AD 30 to 65. This is where we find where Peter is walking and he is doing the leadership of this burgeoning brand new thing called the way, which we would call the beginning of the Christian church. There is in Acts 1-3, it talks about this 40-day post-resurrection cycle that Jesus, when he was resurrected, he spent about 40 days with a group of about 120, they believe. And in that, telling them to wait in Jerusalem. <clears throat> when he was first resurrected, he told the women who were the first to see him to tell everyone to go to Galilee and wait for me there. And he met them there in his post-resurrected form. And surprise, not a ghost. Here I am. You're a supernatural being. This is what it's going to look like on the other side of the, that when you get out of the natural, this is what you're going to be. So there was that wait, you know, waiting for me. But this is a different kind of wait. I need you to wait. And I would love to have heard how Jesus explained this to him. Okay, remember when I told him, Mary and Martha, them guys to tell you to, I know Martha wasn't there, but Mary and Mary and Mary um, <laughs> to wait in Galilee. That's a different wait because that's where we needed to connect so I could spend the 40 days. This wait, you are waiting for the thing you're going to need to be able to, and we watch it as we go through these events that Peter gets to make decisions on and we get to examine his leadership skills. You get to see that without this infilling of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how they navigate it. Right. And they didn't navigate alone. They navigated as a group of 12, but we're not there yet. So he's telling them in Acts 1-3 that there's that 40 days in Acts 1-4 to wait in Jerusalem. And they do. They actually go there and they wait and they're waiting for this. And then in Acts 1-9 through 11, it talks about Jesus ascending. So there's this boom, boom, boom. The beginning of Acts is getting us ready. Luke is writing and getting us ready. And this is what we're going to see in Matthew 16, 19. We're going to see this happen where Jesus is speaking to Peter and he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth is already bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth is already loosed in heaven. Well, yeah, give me those keys. I want to be that person. The one. And then when you stop and think about what he had to make decisions, I was like, ah, no. Nah. I don't think so. But Jesus purposely knowing Peter is <laughs> Peter is the man th that is going to take and do this. He is the person that is going to do this. And I have to wonder, you know, we go through this as far as training leaders and helping people grow in their leadership skill. And it all starts with this person, a person of character. It starts with who they are before what they can do. Because you can teach a lot of the what you can do, but who they are, that is so complicated. So I have to ask myself, when did Jesus, when did the Holy Spirit communicate to Jesus that Peter was going to deny him three times? When did he know this process? Because you don't want to be surprised at that point, right towards the end of your, your leadership, and you're going to be passing it on to this person to find out they had this panic attack and didn't didn't stand. They got knocked over. 
he's going to need to stand and stand firm. When, I just kind of curious, when did he know in the process of what is he going to do and how is he going to solve and that this is really important? Because it turned into be like, it, it turned into be, would you say, the final lesson for Peter, what it's going to take to be a man of fortitude, to be able to stand up against those who were opposing what, and there was a lot, there was history and a culture opposing what they were doing. So he needed to have really, really deep roots and to realize. So I'm wondering when and where and how all of that on Jesus's end fit together so he knew this would be coming up. Right. Yep. Well, and in this, I see the faithfulness of God too, because, um, it was there. We didn't know it was there. Peter didn't know it was there, but it was there. And in order to go where he needed to go, in order to do what he needed to do well and yep. care for people's hearts and tend them as the shepherd that God wanted him to be, that had to have been cared for. Yes. And that had to have been um, a huge transition in yes. Peter's life. Yes. And I see this as you know, Jesus so grateful for, I don't know, his confidence mm -hmm. that Peter would come through at the other side. I, yes. But I have prayed for you. Satan has asked to sift you. But I have prayed for you that when you come back, your faith yes. may not fail. Yes. I mean, what wonderful confidence because Peter hadn't hit the wall yet. Yeah. And yes. so I wonder if that echo of mm -hmm. Jesus's prayer was playing in his oh, heart, point. in his good mind point. of, oh, yes. Jesus knew I would hit this wall. And he was there before I got there, giving me a prophetic anchor of hope to get through it, that yes. this doesn't yes. nullify the dreams of God. This doesn't nullify what I can do for God. Right. I might have had a plan A, but Jesus had a plan Well, it's amazing whatever. through this as we see and have experienced ourselves, there is this trans um, transparency that needs to happen as you grow as a leader. And around here, one of the ways we communicate it is you have to eat your own crow and your team's crow too. Right. You have to get used to this idea of covering for people and people seeing your decision-making process and people being able to comment to you on it. And we are ruthless when it comes to events and, and things that we do trying to make them the best experience ever. And when we pick them apart, not everybody survives that. We've had guests that are part of that, that are part of an event and they see this and they shut down because they're not used to the blunt conversation. So this process of Peter learning to be really transparent with Jesus, Jesus not settling for anything else. Exactly. You have to, that he is taking that now with him and it becomes a normal. It is his normal. So he is expecting it. And now there's going to be a whole nother group of the Stevens and the Phillips and all of those that are yeah. going to be getting used to the same, oh, well, of course I expect that of you. Of course you can do it and watching it happen. So here is where it begins. We find here in Acts chapter 1, verses 15 through 22, Peter makes his first, what I would say is his first leadership move where people are looking at him and what we're going to do now, Peter, everybody turning his direction. So here it says that uh, Peter stood up among the brothers, the, the people that were gathered, a number of people, men and women, and there was about 120. And he, and he said, brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David spoke in advance about Judas. He's talking about Judas is, is dead. He um, fell headfirst in that field, unrighteous, all this horrible stuff that came to him in making a statement that he died this horrible death. This became known to the residents of all Jerusalem, and there's a field called the Field of Blood. So verses 15 through 19 talk about that. And then he goes on to say in the book of Psalms, it talks about there is this prophetic statement. Let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it, and let someone else take his position. So there is this wonderful prophetic word in Psalms telling them that this is what they need to do, which is wonderful because Jesus did this type of stuff all the time, connecting the Old Testament with the New. And it was fun last night because <laughs> for those of you who know me, I do live a messy life in my offices, wherever they are located. I just tend to reflect that. But I did, after 20 years, I moved across the hall into a new office. and. As I'm moving things around, I, I find this uh, gospel transformation Bible, study Bible, I didn't know I owned, and I'm not sure where it came from, and it's new. 
it wasn't a gift to me because there's there's no inscription on the inside. So I decided, well, this will be a great gift to give because this is exactly what Jesus taught Peter to do and Peter is doing. All the way from Genesis to Revelation, there's this Christology, this study of Jesus' presence throughout all of Scripture, how it all connects. And so Peter is doing that verbally here. So we did, and congratulations, Deb. I hope you enjoy that. And getting this idea, so he is making this connection. Here in Psalms, it's talking about this. This needs to be taken care of. So we're going to, from among the men who've accompanied us the whole time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So beginning from the baptism of John, when John baptized Jesus in the river, in the Jordan River, that person needed to be present then all the way to when he just ascended. So this chunk of time, we need to select individuals, and then we need to make a decision. And in my questioning, I'm wondering if, this, if these individuals were also there earlier, if they were people who encountered John the Baptist, because we found out how many of the 12 disciples were interested in John the Baptist, and they seen, they were ready, they were hungry. There was this thing already in them that they needed to know, and they were attracted to seeing scriptures be fulfilled. That was in their DNA already. So I just have a question, how many of them were there actually earlier than the baptism in the river? But Peter gives them this measuring tool. They have to have been. Otherwise, you just can't explain it. They had to have experienced it. And so they come up with the two names. And they have... <laughs> oh, here we go. We have Matthias, and he has a name. I told him last night. It's actually in... I had this, and here's me being scattered. I thought I came across a little scattered last night because there's so many scripture verses. <laughs> And this is a, yes, Joseph called Barsabbas and Justice, and also known as Justice. So that's why Joseph, Barsabbas, and Justice, and then Matthias. So Joseph called Barsabbas, who's also known as Justice, is just one person. So there's two different people that they are going to be making a decision on. And what I find really interesting is the way that they did it here in Acts 1, 22 through 26, they actually drew lots. They cast lots. They shot dice. They did a, a game of chance, if you will. There wasn't any voting, which I thought was really, really interesting. And I have heard that this type of process happens still today when different churches and different belief systems are looking for someone. They have a crew of qualified leaders, and there's no voting. They just pick a name out of a hat type of thing because you're all qualified, and we'll just leave it to that. So here are the two guys. They go through this casting of lots, and Matthias is the one selected. So he steps in, and so now there are 12 disciples again. And it's important because 12 is this visible representation of the covenant of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they are making the statement that the Torah and the temple got us to this point. Now Jesus is saying from this point, we are the body of Christ. We are the body. This is a continuum. And here is where a lot of the arguments took place in Peter's and in the apostles' lives. This continuum. No, you're something new. You're not a continuum of this. And they're saying, yes, we are a continuum of this. Read the Old Testament. It talks about this happening. And we're telling you, Jesus was the Messiah. So this lovely, and it doesn't say how long it took. It doesn't say what else they did. Did they have a swearing-in ceremony? Did he have to move? I mean, who knows? So there's these things going on, and this is still taking place here before this crazy experience called Pentecost. So first order of business. Well, and, and right away, it really strikes me of what a pastoral move. Because when it says here in Acts 1.15, um, during these days Peter stood up among the brothers, and he immediately goes in to providing, uh, what did he see going on with this group of people where he, it rose up within him to show them, to reflect them, the solid ground that they actually stood on. So things looked a little crazy, but here we have Good. Peter being a yeah. pastor, yeah. and he's showing them, wait, guys, look at the solid ground that's actually under your feet. Scripture says this. Scripture says this. Scripture yes. says this. Yes. This is that actually happening right among us. Yes. How comforting that yes. must have been for this rattled group of people. Yes. And... They made that first crazy step in accepting Peter as the leader of the, of the motley crew of 120. Mm -hmm. So here they have this, and they are still waiting, as they were instructed before he ascended, to go wait again. So they're in 
Jerusalem waiting and being nervous. Okay, it, it has been a while, you know, a little over a month. I don't know how long they actually waited in Jerusalem. I have probably read that in some people's commentaries, their suggestions, but nothing has stuck in my head. So they are there, they're waiting. And now we get to see Peter's leadership in the unknown, because nobody knows what's going to be happening. So we're talking about a total crazy, crazy train experience that they've never, brand new experience, they've never had this happen before, they've never seen it before, no one has. And so it can be called the birthday of the church, the church being born. Here it is, it's called Pentecost and how Peter navigates this. We see in Luke 13, 24, Matthew 7, 14, and Acts 2, 21, talking about make every effort to enter through the narrow door because I tell you many will try to enter and won't be able. How narrow is the gate? And difficult the road that leads to life and few find it whoever calls on the name of the lord will be saved so looking at there's this difficult process to this but there's also this idea of yes whoever calls on the name of the lord will be saved and these are all talking about the same process but in order to know how to make these two things gel this is where the holy spirit comes in jesus is speaking about it seems complicated but it's really not complicated but not everybody is going to find this a fascination. We still experience that today, where people, you know, religion is a crutch, or it is, you know, something that you do that's community-oriented, so it makes you part of a community. You know, it's good for you, but it really doesn't affect you. All of these different things that we can say that talks about a community experience. And Jesus is saying that this is hard. It's simple. No, let's go. It's simple but it's not easy right. it's simple but it's not easy so we're looking at how how does the audience that hears get through this door because the 120 under the leadership of Peter is not supposed to be this little group that goes and moves into a commune in the desert and provides for themselves. That isn't the model Jesus taught them. That isn't what he wants them to do. So in their submission to Jesus's words, they're waiting. And so they're waiting in that room. Peter is helping them make decisions and running things. They're, they're respecting his leadership. And then the crazy train comes in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. I'm not reading all 13, but I'll read the first few verses. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Lovely sentence. They were all unified, not just physically there, but unified in spirit. And suddenly there is the sound of a violent rushing wind that came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. So you're there, people are praying, they're talking, you're drinking your tea or coffee, somebody's wondering what's going to be made for lunch, and do you have to, you know, is it my turn to do this? So your normal everyday thing, they're in this place, and boom, this loud, loud sound comes in. It sounds like a violent rushing wind, but nothing is moving. It doesn't say that it's blowing them around the house. It's just the sound of wind is coming. And I shared this last night that way back when there was this move of the Holy Spirit down in Bradenton, Florida, my husband went down there and he, there was a pastor's event and he went down there and he said that it was the closest he's ever come to having a real experience that encapsulated this verse that you're just there in worship an amazing experience worshiping with all these people loving up on God and he took his glasses which he doesn't wear now because he's had LASIK surgery but he put them in his pocket he remembers and just cried just stood there and sang and cried but then he said because his eyes were shut he hears this sound and he said it sounded something like a train to him like a train coming and he said I just I had to open my eyes and I look up, there's nothing up there, and then I, and I can still hear it, but there's nothing there. So there is this experience. They're all having this. And so how did, they, how did they act? How did they react to this? What did they say? What did they do? How long did it last? Because while they're listening to the coming around, then these, these, they're like little flames, little tongues of fire goes on top of each one's head. So they all can see it. So they're, they're having a brain science experience here, Pastor Robin. They're hearing it, and they're seeing it. And then... They were all given this ability by the Holy Spirit to speak in different tongues as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. So they hear this thing, they see this thing, and then they all go crazy. So a true crazy train. And what did Peter do at this time? How long were they in this room while this was going on? It got to be a really big noise because they ended up coming out of that area and people seen them. <laughs> and people were responding to them as you go back through Acts 2, you know, verses... Five down to 13, they're hearing them and they're astounded. There's all these different 
people from different nations in there say like when the sound occurred a crowd came together so they had to hear the sound of either the rushing wind or they heard them speaking to me i believe it's talking about they heard the rushing wind they heard that sound and they're running what's going on so the holy spirit took care of getting a crowd organized for them and so they're there and they were all really confused because they know these these people and they see the 12 disciples the 12 apostles and they know they're from galilee and they're speaking portuguese and they're speaking Spanish and they're speaking French and they're speaking whatever, Russian or whatever. They're speaking these languages that were available back then. And how in the world can they speak that so perfectly? And I know who they are. So they're, and so then Peter says, wait a minute, guys, they're not drunk like you would suppose because it's only nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> all right. I just want to let you know that it's only nine o'clock in the morning. And then he goes on and whatever happens, the 12 must be in front of the crew of 120, because it says in verse 14 that Peter stood up with the 11. In my head, I had forgotten about the 11 standing by him, but they all stood up together. I don't know if Peter got up on a rock or stood on top of something so everybody could see him better, which probably they did in the day and age. And he raised his voice and he proclaimed to them, men of Judah and all you res residents of Jerusalem, let me explain to you and pay attention to my words. I'm going to tell you exactly what's going on. So Peter is stepping into this leadership. And he goes on and gives the message of messages, and he talks them through the Old Testament, how they got to the day, how they got to where they are. And he goes in verse 17, that it'll be in the last days. God says these things. He, he shares the prophecy of Joel too. I'm going to pour out my spirit. Hello, this is what he was talking about. This is the pouring out of the spirit. Everybody mark this day. Take out your phones, mark it in your calendar, that this is the day that this has happened. We are now moving into this last phase of the, what did the, it was called something in one, uh, the redemptive history, the last stage of redemptive history. And he wanted them to clearly understand that this is going to be happening. There's going to be wonders in heaven above and signs on earth below. And then in verse 22, of Acts chapter 2, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. This is Jesus the Nazarene. He was a man pointed out to you by God with these miracles, wonders, and signs. And there's Lazarus, the big walking billboard sign, you know, that says he he's alive because of what the miraculous power that, that Jesus, that was worked through Jesus, and the signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. And he's pointing to these things. And though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan, he explains the death, burial, and resurrection of, of Jesus. And he talks about the lawless people that put him on the cross and killed him. And he says in verse 29, Brothers, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David. He is both dead and buried, and his true tomb is with us to this day. And I'm pretty sure he pointed it out because it wasn't too far from where he was speaking and talking about this is in the whole lineage of this. David prophesied about this Messiah, and this is who he is. And then he ends the sermon in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So here's all 12 standing as Peter is preaching, and he's just going, and he's connecting their history with their present day and understanding that the patronage system that was forged that they've all grown up in is now turning into this community system. These 12 apostles are learning how to navigate, and you're going to see as we continue our study here on who is this man called Peter, we're going to see as he writes First and Second Peter how he embraces this community system. He talks about the promise being fulfilled, uh, prophesied in Joel 2. And we're going to see those redemptive history, that stuff is also spoken about in First and Second Peter. So how much of this is based on the atonement and resurrection and redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And he talks about there's a permanent timeline shift. We are now moving out of the temple and the Torah era, and we're moving into this family of God era. And it had to absolutely shake the earth of some that this guy is crazy and this is wrong but there had to be some standing there saying this is what that meant all of this crazy because remember 400 years of silence there was all of this prophetic work malachi writes his last there's 400 years of nothing quote unquote nothing and then john the baptist shows up and people uh -huh, yeah here we go we're ready. We're getting a new phase of prophets. I'm not sure what God is up to, but we're, this is who we are. This is who we are as people. And then the Messiah shows up. And this 
crazy, wait a minute, this is a little too much. Maybe raising someone from the dead might be something I prefer to read about, but then there's those that's like, okay, this this is it. And it, it wasn't just the 120. Under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, what Peter was, was sharing, those that were there and still open to listen, they were making the connection with their entire heritage that this is happening. The Those that were of, of Jewish descent, that they were there from all the different areas here in Jerusalem at this time specifically arranged for. This is why they were waiting in the upper room for this specific day, for this to happen. The connection to be made for those from all over the Middle East were in this city hearing this sermon. And and here we have, this is the, we just got through reading Pastor Orlean where Peter stood up with the 120. Yes. And he framed. Yes. What did he see that they needed that? Here Peter stands up again, and he reframes, yes. not to 120, but to 3,000. And yes. how does he do it? He does it with Scripture. Yes. And just like you say, there had to have been people as he was methodically laying this out, because at each point he says, here's the information, therefore, and gives a next step. And he does that exact same pattern here. He lays out scripture, and then he says, therefore. So because of all that I read yes. for you, this, and he transitions them with this solid scriptural backing into where their next steps are. And I'm so impressed with the... Um, the direction of the Lord through Peter here, because he gives them a map through scripture that they know is solid, that they can land on. And you know, there were people there whose spirits were quickened where whatever that puzzle piece was of, aha, you're right. That makes perfect sense. Aha. That puzzle piece had to be popping into their spirits yes. that yes, I know what you're saying is right. That resonates with me too. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Peter, for stepping up and providing that comfort and providing the security of, of Scripture. And I'm just um, energized by what was going on in his own relationship with the Holy Spirit, where I'm only imagining, just from past experience, that rise up within you of, I know what this is. Yes. They need to know this. Yes. It will provide them comfort. Yes. Oh, yay, it, Peter. It's an equation in your head. Mm -hmm. This and this and this goes to here. And then he makes this final statement in Acts 2.32, this defining statement, I should say, this Jesus God raised up and that all of us are witnesses. This is him, this Jesus that God, we are all witnesses of everything I'm telling you that's happened. This 120 here, we have all witnessed this. And there, you know, and you were there at this time, it's not written in this, but I could see Peter making the connection. And you, the, you were there at that time because these are there's a lot of people there that live in the area, so he would be able to pick them out and that the visitors would be able to watch this. And watching all of this connecting their old, their present, their recent history, their ancient history, and then connecting it with their present to the point that we get down to verse 37 in Acts chapter 2. And the, the crowd that heard this, they came under a deep conviction, the Holy Spirit making things very transparent and open and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what must we do? So here we're having this very first Pentecostal experience that re results in what the Holy Spirit is here to do. The Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus says and illuminates who Jesus is. And so Peter says, well, repent, repent of all of the stuff that's standing in between you and your belief in Christ and be baptized each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now when we read this, we see it as our scriptural context for those who are evangelical that this is the process of what. But what's interesting to note is the believers that were there understand the temple system. They understand what Peter is saying. The temple system has now been changed into going instead of through the holies of holies that we couldn't go through that the chief priest would go through, we now get to go into the holies of holies through this process called prayer, that we get to experience. So some of them had to go, hey, wait a second, it doesn't compute yet. What did you just say, Peter? Could you please repeat that? You're talking about what goes on in the temple now can happen in my heart and in my own prayer time and in my own experience. 
So this Jesus that was a human being here that we could touch and was tangible has now returned into where this supernatural stuff happens, but we still have access. So we can know. So trying to make that, I have to wonder how many just stood there after the crowd dispersed trying to make this connection. Oh. How many went down to the Jordan and got baptized? Because they understood John's baptism was preparing them for something. I'm ready. I'm ready. And it's easy to be ready when you don't know what's coming. And then here comes this great big train. And here comes all this craziness. And then the baptism of Jesus is initiatory. It, it, it initiates us into this new process. In this crowd specifically, it's a continuum, but a big change from the temple into what Peter is saying is now applicable. So this had to be, we read it and we go, yay, the Holy Spirit. But it had to be just earth shattering for some of them as far as, oh, I'm going to have to go home. Um, uh, K.E. Bailey in his one of his books, I forgot to list what book it's from, but he puts this statement, the unifying factor of the new Israel is no longer adherence to Torah and temple, but faith in Jesus Christ, the Lord, who fulfills and transcends the intent of both. So it's a completion of the Torah and the temple system. So Peter, that's what he is preaching to them, and that's where they have this huge experience. They go from a community of 120 people that have hung around for a few weeks after Jesus' ascension. And I don't know if Jesus told Peter to get ready. Did he run him through? Did he take a class on how to be a civic engineer? So all of a sudden, 120 to 3,000 people are hanging and being and trying. Where did they go? Where did they hang out? Who right. brought the pup tent? How many of them? I mean, this whole concept from this experience of Pentecost, they went from this community that is uh, dubbed the way in Acts chapter two, and they figure out how to do life together. Who gets to make these decisions? What's it like when you run out of toilet paper in a group this size? All of these weird things, but they do it and they do it as a group of 12. And what's fascinating to me too, Pastor O, is um, last night you asked, how did they do this? And I responded um, really messily. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this yes. had to have been just a messy oh, yes. process. Because not only, you, you mentioned how did the group um, uh, recognize it or receive this, and I'm thinking stupefaction. Yes. I mean, yes. I would be Good. completely yep. stupefied yep. because what they didn't realize in this very moment in this never before done in history moment is everything is different all of a sudden they're going to be counterculture yes they have a yes. culture where everything is set up on the temple system everything is set up it is their community it is their culture it is their worship it is their grocery store it is their you know how they handle and navigate all of life and in this one moment they may not realize the fullness of it, but from this point on, they're going to be running counterculture to the very culture that they have been in. Yes. And I can only imagine, because, you know, certainly not to this magnitude uh, degree, but, you know, when you meet Jesus, I can remember... I shortly after I became born again, I, I made an appointment with uh, a pastor's wife uh, of the church that I just started attending because I needed her to tell me what do Christians do for fun. So what exactly do y'all do for fun? Because I don't know how to live here. Yes. All I know how to do is have fun the old way. What do you guys do? I asked her, do you just sit around and cross stitch or what do you do? <laughs> and she laughed. Yeah. You know, I yeah. had no idea because it's almost like I've been breathing air all this time. And in a sudden moment, now I breathe water. Yes. And live underwater. Yes. And so I'm seeing this group of people here. Okay, they've got to ha learn how to navigate and be respectful of wait, the temple system? I'm the temple system. What, what, mm -hmm. how do we, yes. what about offering? What about forgiveness? What about, I got yes. I, these yes. animals, I need to exchange it for doves. I mean, what do I do with this now? Yes. So I can imagine that was a lot of their conversation with Peter and the 11. How do I live here now? Yes. And I have to wonder too, when it, it tells us in scripture at Jesus's death, that the temple curtain tore in two right. and it tore from top to bottom. I was talking with Pastor Gell, and she was telling me that the way it went was even more difficult. Right. And it was huge, and it was heavy, and it was crazy. How many of the, the priests that worked in this had seen the torn, the torn curtain? Right. How much that chatter was going on in this experience as well? 
how many of them were able to say, and not the 12 and not the 120, but just the people out in the crowd because the social media grapevine back then was gossip, we would call, or just talking to your neighbor. And who wouldn't talk about all these signs that happened when Jesus was when he was buried and his death and that whole process. So that piece of information had to be floating through somebody's brain, talking exactly. to somebody in there, trying to, like you said, that stupefaction process, trying to connect all these things. And guess who is the leader in charge of this? It is Peter, but he has the support of the 11 others who can say, yeah, what he is saying is true. We know this sounds crazy, but this is exactly what happened. And don't let anybody lie to you. You don't have to like it. You don't have to say that you agree with the process that you still want to do this. I, I find comfort in my my history and all that. We're just telling you that this is what it was talking about. Now you get to, like we have, you get to figure out how that truth fits. Just don't go make up your own truth. Just don't do that. We do that all the time as human beings. When we don't want to do something, we create our own reality. And they are letting them know, no. This is what it feels like when what has been prophesied becomes true. These big, we've been waiting, and change is so hard for human beings, but this is a change. And if you just stop and think it through, you've been trained in Scripture. You know exactly this process. You ask yourself, who else is going to fulfill? I know that there was a Bible study that talked about all of the prophecies in the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled them all. There had to be. It had to happen really soon because that's what Peter is doing right here in the sermon. All of those things, we studied them to learn them as grown-ups, but they knew them because they've studied them all their life. It right. was part of their everyday conversation. Right. Hey, what did we do in the Torah reading today? We did this, and what did we do with that? And exactly. All this amazing stuff. And how, how invigorating that conversation must have been. Because, you know, when you sit down and have your Torah study with the lens of what just happened, huh, okay, that makes sense now. Yes. Or that, yes. oh, okay, yes. huh. Yes. I mean, that must have been an engaging conversation. And that's where we are always encouraged, even to this day, that this is what research does. This is where questions needing to be answered. You don't get satisfied with the partial answer. This answers this piece, but then there's this piece. And you talk about empirical study and how hard it is to understand supernatural things because you can't touch them. And you, and you need to have something that you can prove. And if we need something we can prove before we make decisions, we would never fall in love. We would never commit ourselves to um, works of, of great change because you never sure, you can't promise me that's the ending. You can't promise me these people will really be, be helped. You can't promise me that this feeling I have is an attraction and a commitment to that person that would I, and there's all of these things that we give ourselves to because we like the idea or it's fulfilling or it captures us and we don't realize there's no empirical evidence in this. It's, uh, yeah, it, it makes sense to have children to just have a family unit for them to grow up. I mean, all of that, but why does it, why do we think it's right to just have the one? Why do we think all of these weird questions <laughs> that we don't even try to address, but we use a different type of thinking process and decision-making process when it comes to accepting the supernatural and what scripture is talking about, that we want to demand that you prove that this is real. You demand that Jesus is, is proven who he said he was. And instead of giving our, ourself the, what I think Peter was going after in this process, you've learned all this. Now it comes the opportunity for you to walk it out without proof. You are going to be the proof to see if it's real. You, you know how to make decisions. You know if somebody's trying to hoodwink you. You know if someone's trying to lie to you. You're going to know if it's not a real or if it's an orchestrated experience. If you have a supernatural experience with a supernatural God, you're going to know it. But you're never going to have it if you're not looking for it and waiting and to see if it's possible. So if you write it all off and you just stay away from all that stuff, well, he may come grab you, yeah. But there is also this process, well, I'm going to go check it out and do my, my due diligence and go inspect it and see what happens when I'm there. So I just find it interesting that Peter is challenging this process. You've done all this. You have this as your quote-unquote history. It's proven. It's lived. It was there. And now I'm asking you to step out and apply it the way that it was prophesied. I want you to go live and to see if serving Jesus as Messiah is going to change your life, is going to change your world, is going to cost you something 
like you said, you're going to be moving out of this paradigm into a, a new community type of living. You're going to live against the culture that you grew up in. It's going to cost you something. It's going to be hard. But it's also going to reveal to you the supernatural that you're headed for and who created you in this whole system. You're going to meet that person, which they already had accepted existed. Amen. Because this is he who is faithful and little will be given much. I mean, um, uh, God honoring obedience, and when we're obedient in the little, we get more opportunities to be obedient. I mean, you see them giving opportunity to put faith in action, and there is some experiential learning of of faith, of a relationship with God, of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit, that you can't get standing outside of looking in with a judging eye, so much as being engaged in the process and experiencing it one foot in front of the other at a time. Yes. Yes. And so yes. the um, uh, they're being called to put put what you know in action. Mm-hmm. Watch the results. Yes. Yes. And 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 baby steps of discipleship, because this is exactly what we do today. You know, what a joy when um, someone is awakened to a relationship with Jesus or uh, wanting to, whatever, test the waters out. I mean, date Jesus before you get married, for goodness sake. Come and find out. Yes, I love that he doesn't say, trust me. He says, come follow me. Yes, Because in the following we learn to trust him because yes. we find experientially, wow, he's trustworthy. Yes, yes. We find truths. Exactly. Truths that actually are bedrock and work. Right. Yes. Amen. So here we have the end of that. There's 3,000. They have this great big messy growing community. It is an experiment. It's new. <laughs> Who does the laundry? Where are the facilities? How do I take a shower? How many of them didn't have homes in the area? Did they all it, they all wanted to stay together? Where in the city did they go? How far out into the desert did they live? I mean, where were they located, and how did they nomadically go here and there? And did people just stay in other people's houses? Which is, I'm assuming, what a lot of it happened. And somewhere, Peter and the crew are parked. Peter and the apostles are parked somewhere, so individuals can come. And as people are experiencing, and it says that go back here, that they committed themselves in Acts 2.42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they came, and they they had actual teaching, much like Jesus did, and to the fellowship, you know, to the community, to the breaking of bread, this idea of of communion together, and to, to prayers. So this is what they did. This was the organizational structure, exactly where did they live and how they did it. I'm assuming it just kind of, well, there's room in this house, and who wants to stay here? And all of this happening. Now, keeping in mind that back in Palestine at this time, 90% of the wealth was with the aristocracy, 10% of the the community. So you had 90% of the community trying to make a living on 10% of the wealth. So here they had to create a system of how to care for those. And it's interesting because in Acts 4, at the end of Acts 4, Barnabas does this crazy thing that they list there that he owns some property. Now, selling property is like selling selling out your Social Security and your Medicare and cashing it in and giving that money to the poor. So that, that is what it would have been like. But he had some property that was part of his, his either business dealings or his family, and he decided to sell it and just give the money to the apostles to to disseminate however they would like, to take and do whatever they would like with it. And this process wasn't just for Barnabas. Other people were doing it, but (laughs) because we were in a room last night that had an aisle and we could talk about, now here they come walking down the aisle and here's all the crowd realizing what this money is going to do. It's going to provide food and shelter for this and it's going to take, it is taking care and feeding and housing the poor. So people are applauding so they can stay here and learn and become a community before they actually have to leave the city. And they didn't know. They didn't have a timeline. They didn't, we're going to do this for a month. I don't think they knew that. They just, okay, people are still coming coming. We're growing in size. We need to figure out where to put this and how's these and how to do this and where are we going to go for our meetings because this building is now too small. I know, let's go to two services. Let's go to three services. Let's just never leave the building. I mean, all of these amazing, crazy things trying to figure out the civic processing of what's going to happen with this new church. And here comes this individual who's part of the 10% who owns something and donates it freely with great delight. I believe this is what God would have me do. We have seen it here. 
that the building that we reside in is here because of individuals like that that are still coming to church here that have sacrificed. And that's one of the things that helps you develop this, not an attachment to the building, but this ferocity of don't you dare mess with the people here. They've sacrificed, not just for a building. That's not what they sacrifice for. They sacrifice for a healthy community, realizing this changes not just people's lives, but it changes an entire community. Because I wonder too, Pastor O, just in what it is you're talking about, if one situation led to this situation, because in my imagination, they're in Peter's courtyard, you know, maybe where James and John and his mother-in-law lived and all that kind of stuff. And, and they're in this compound and there's not enough room and they're going through food because there's people there, yeah, yes, you know, they yes. need. And, and what about the, the person whose life has been completely transformed by Jesus in this process? And they were kicked out of their family home. How many were? Yes. How many? Yes. I mean, Good and so point. here all of a sudden they have absolutely nothing of what their current social structure says is the security for their future. Correct. And without the support of the church and the assistance, they're just destitute. Destitute. Yes. And how dangerous that whole process can be. And, and so seeing the need of people that you have rather quickly come to love yes. in their new faith in Christ and wanting to do whatever you can to help them be solid and protected and, and cared for. And of course, people's hearts were stirred with, well, I've got this, I can do this, or I can do this part, I can do this. And then how wonderful of Barnabas and, and moving us. So I can see the, the movement yes. that landed us in the spot we're about to be in. Yes. And their hearts are committed to one another. They mm -hmm. want a safe place right. for all of this to happen because it cannot happen without oversight, without people making sure that it's healthy and that it's safe and that individuals are ca actually cared for and nobody gets you know, uh, taken advantage of. And I right. mean, the whole structure of a healthy family, whether it's a corporate family, a church family, or your physical family of origin, healthy makes all the difference in the world. So that's what the 12 apostles are working at. And we see that throughout the New Testament, how they make changes and decisions, mm -hmm. which we'll also see when we get together for the week five, looking at some of the decisions that come out of Peter's beginning experiences. Because the next time in the next podcast, when we're on week five, we're going to see when uh, Peter is confronted by his own bigotry and what happens. And it's an amazing, transparent, beautiful thing because it helps us realize how easy Easily we hide these things from ourselves, but that is in the next podcast. But here we're looking at the next thing. So they have this burgeoning community, and they want to care for it and supply it. So these individuals see their leaders caring for them and making sure that they have health, unlike they've seen because Jesus was all over what was going on in the temple because they would not care for their people. They would not, uh, how can you be mad at me for taking care of the sheep that you won't even go look for? You don't even know they're there, and I'm going to make sure they know that God sees them and God loves them. This is your job, and you're not, and now you're mad at me, and you're having a fit because I'm doing the ones that you want. So this whole process of the apostles are now getting the opportunity to put structure to the heart of Jesus that they are meeting as a community. And we're going to care for one another as a community. We are now, when they said family of God, they meant their understanding of family. It's a totally different definition than what we see here in our American culture as family. And I wonder what, and it's only my imagination again, but I wonder if knowing that there was about to become a division because of what he was about to do, his death, burial, and resurrection, and then the uh, coming of the Holy Spirit, and knowing what a... Uh, a, a ripple effect, an earthquake effect that's going to have on the community and that there were going to be some that were destitute or left out there or whatever. I wonder if that contributed to his anger in the temple of, no, these are, these are our people. Yes. We must care for them and look at how you're abusing them. It cannot yes. be tolerated. Yes. It's just my yes. Hey, when he, when he cleansed that temple, I still, whenever I go back and read that and pause and think of what it would be like if that was me walking mm. in there and the different illustrations we find for our culture today that right. would be you know substitute substitutable for what he's seen and you can feel it when you start doing that conversation with someone your blood pressure starts to increase if you walked in a situation that was abusive and what they were doing and how they were fleecing the people so here they were they're trying to do the antithesis of that they're going the other direction where it is safe and that sets us up for the next thing that peter gets to do in his leadership in acts chapter five so i know that after this all was over 
Peter and the apostles looked at each other and said, Jesus, you should have told us about this one. <laughs> you should have told us that this could happen. But they seen, they seen reflections of this process somewhere. So they have this amazing touchstone of watching the Holy Spirit work through Jesus and seeing all these crazy things. Because in the Gospel of John, John says, if everything was written down, there wouldn't be enough books to contain everything that Jesus did. So every breathing moment that Jesus is in this public ministry, there's all of this stuff going on behind the th scenes stuff that we're not going to have access to until we get to heaven and you're plugged into the, the eternal know of everything. And so what did they see? Did anything in their life train them for this? So when you're going through this, it's whoa. So it appears that the 11 apostles in Peter are sitting somewhere in authority and individuals are coming in. We just talked about Barnabas bringing in this money. And so they bring in the money and they donate it and they give it. And of course there's people standing around. There's people everywhere. There's people coming out of this, the mortar and the bricks. I mean, there's just people everywhere all the time. They are trying to organize this community and be together and they just really want to. They don't want to go to sleep. This is amazing. The Messiah has come and here we get to be the beginning of the community that lives knowing that. So. There is this man named Ananias. His name means God is gracious, and his beautiful wife, Sapphira, whose name means beautiful. They sold a piece of property. They, they had this, and this is a big deal to sell property back then, just like it is now, but even more so because of what it means historically in your family. And however, Ananias decided to keep part of the, the proceeds, and his wife knew this was going on. And he brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. So he's doing the same process. And Peter says to him, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds of the field? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it and after you sold it, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So by just notice that Ananias didn't, say anything that's recorded here. I mean, Peter sees him coming, and this is his greeting. And when Ananias heard these words, he dropped dead. I mean, he dropped dead. And everybody stopped talking. Everybody stopped moving. They said, and a great fear came on all who heard it. And I was like, yeah, it should have. Mm -hmm. That's right. The young man got up, wrapped his body, and carried him out and buried him. In the moment of panic, everybody just stands there or sits there. And then others come rushing in because all of a sudden the hubbub and the chatter and the, whoa, what's going on? It's super quiet. I'm, I'm assuming there was weeping. The whole atmosphere of this room had to change. When you just think of what it's like, a whole bunch of people, things are hip-hop happening and you're excited and you see all of this and it's just amazing fellowship and community and you're watching it grow and you're feeling Jesus put brick by brick of people creating this new community and all of a sudden this happens and tsh, lights out. That atmosphere is totally gone. So individuals had to be coming to this area because they could hear the lack of noise or they could hear the shift of noise and they see this dead person laying. So <laughs> trying to set up a, an understanding for those of you in our, our listening audience. Yeah, that sounds good. On Wednesday nights, I'm on the floor. I don't stand up on the stage, but I'm on the floor. And we do a lot of Q&A and a lot of chitter chatter because I really need to see faces and they need to see mine because I'm a little bit animated, just a wee bit animated when I'm telling stories. And the doors, I mean, we have a group of four doors in the back of the auditorium. And imagine Ananias coming and there's people who've come before and here they drop this money and they do this and people are, yay, yay, and there's glitter and parades and banners and we're celebrating because this... This is done by free will. This isn't a tax. This isn't demanded. And we know the money is going to feed these people and care for them. It's not like it disappears. You give it and it's supposed to, but nothing ever happens to it. No, we've watched it already happen. This is amazing. So everybody's really excited. So there is this excitement. And here, Peter sees Ananias coming. And so do the other 11 apostles. And I brought this up last night. It's like, what did he see that he could say this? Now, we know that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Pente Pentecost had already happened. So the Holy Spirit's in there, illuminating Jesus and what he said, illuminating their experiences of living with Jesus for those three years. And what is it? I'm wondering if, and this is me and my amazing imagination, if 
the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, who actually slices Judas's personality open and lets us see who he was and that he was stealing from their treasury. I mean, they knew he was stealing. And Jesus is like, hey, guys, I got it. Hey, guys, I got it. So they knew the spirit of deception and the spirit of division and the spirit of I got to do it my way and not caring about the community because Judas basically did it. seemed like what Judas wanted. He told himself he wanted the same outcome as the rest of the apostles. And I know he believed that he did. But really what he wanted was to be in control. And so he plotted this plan, well, I will, I will t t tell the chief priest and whatever where Jesus is because I, I will give them access to him because then Jesus will have to become the Messiah and he'll have to start the movement that I know he's the Messiah of. And then I'm going to run the treasury of that movement. And I'm going to have a bigger kitty of money to steal from, but I won't take much, just enough to continue to do my great job. Whatever lies you believe to talk yourself into doing something, they watched it happen in Judas's body. They watched it happen to him. And then it talks about, too, there's a connection, too, about people. Peter being tempted by Satan and he denied out of fear. So Peter knows the feeling of walking away from Jesus out of fear. So there's this thing about Satan having an effect on you, evil having an effect on you. So what is it that Peter's seen as Ananias is walking to him? Because it's not like Ananias jumped up from a side door, boo, here I am. Peter had an opportunity, in my opinion, to watch the man walk up to them. Because there's a lot of people around, and people are, hey, I'd be hanging there if I was around at the time. I'd want to see what was going on. And he, he looks at him. So did John come up and say, that's Judas? Did the other apostles say anything to Peter before he said this? I mean, how long did it take Ananias to walk there? When did they first spot him? I'm sure Ananias carried a nice bag so everybody could see he's giving because this was the whole idea. He wanted people to give him the accolades without making any of the sacrifice. So, and he drops it at their feet. And then Peter makes this crazy statement. So everyone in that listening crowd, they, they know their scripture, right? So there is a lot of examples in the Old Testament of individuals not following God's decree when you look through the time of Moses and the developing of the nation of Israel. And when they're told, you get rid of this, you don't take any of the spoils of war, you don't touch it, you don't keep it, you get rid of it all because it's all contaminated, it's all whatever, whatever. Well, there's this individual in Joshua 7, his name is Achan, where he takes three things, a, a robe, some money, and something else. And Israel ends up losing a battle and people die that they die, they, they lose battle and people die. And Joshua stops everything. We have to inquire of the Lord of what's going on. And when they find out that there's sin in the camp and the sin, they do the casting of lots to determine who it is. And it ends up being this family and they confront him. And here it's like, but I seen these beautiful things and I wanted them. They're beautiful things and I wanted them. You're wanting them cause people to die. So the understanding of having, I don't even know how you would define this, it's not even narcissistic, it's, it's evil. But it doesn't feel evil, it just feels personal. I, I just want the accolades, or I just want the items, or I just want my way, or I just want... And here we see Peter saying, this is evil, this is Satan causing you to do this, that you, not causing you, he doesn't jump in you and make you do anything. You open the door, as we've seen with the life of Judas. This is Satan toying with you, and you've given in. Why have you given in? Why have you become the instrument of Satan instead of the instrument of Christ? And looking at Ananias, and we just had a party with this conversation last night, overwhelming all of us of the process. What does this look like today? Because the story's not over. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's more to come. And what were the people thinking, and how many of them went back to these stories in the Old Testament that now this is happening? We wanted a prophet again. Well, here, we got our prophet. We got the Messiah. And now these are the things that happen with this wonderful tension of, I want it my way. No, it's supposed to be this way. And here, they got to see a living example of what happens when someone feeds that human desire to be in control and do it their way instead of what Scripture says. And... and um, Pastor O, you've been there. I have too. You know, those things that we have wrestled through in our past, I know many would recognize this. It's almost like you develop a sniffer for it. Yes. You know, you can smell that thing coming a mile away because of the wrestling that you've done in the past. Yes. I wonder 
Was this a gift of knowledge from the Holy Spirit that he implanted in his heart? This is what's going on. How many times, when we go back and look at Peter's relationship with Jesus, Jesus, how many times did Peter correct Jesus? Oh, Jesus, you got it wrong. Here, Jesus, um, I, (laughs) you know, and what you don't realize is I think I know it better than you, God. (laughs) And so here's Ananias. No, no, I think I got it better than you. I think I know. I, I, yeah, I got this. Um, I don't need to do it that way. It's really not that big of a deal. And I mean, yeah, they're the ability to, in the Holy Spirit, have yes. the wisdom, gift of knowledge, the wisdom in the moment, because like you point out, Ananias didn't utter a word. And the confirmation because you know he could have said no that's not true yes. there must be a misunderstanding somewhere whatever oh look here in my other pockets oh, the rest of it right and so <laughs> peter initiates the conversation based on whatever input he's getting and the confirmation that it was god was ananias dropping dead right there yes Huge Boom, mic drop. Exactly. Boom. And yes. so and coming back to this growing, beginning new community mm-hmm. and the protection of the Lord that He does provide for spiritual communities like this Christian communities, where, because we have watched it happen here. Right. I mean, my husband remembers coming across this book, Tale of Three Kings, and he credits that coming at the time when it should because it illuminated scripture in such a way for him that you don't ever get into this. You do not ever do that. Saul, David, Absalom process. You stay David. You stay in that, and you just let the Lord take care of the mess because you don't want to be the person construing and reconstructing God's will, like Judas did, for their own personal advantage because their heart is seated in evil because they want this personal advantage, and then they excuse away all these things. So here... Something that, you know, so he just wanted to keep his money and he was trying to be a big shot. We see that all the time. People, these quote unquote little lies. But this lie, there was more going on than what, and that's what struck me. It's like, why so harsh? Why such a (laughs) done? And on purpose, the Holy, I mean, did Peter know Ananias was going to die? Boom. I don't think he did. I I don't think think the Holy Spirit gave him the information. I believe in the moment they seen the spirit that they could recognize because They lived with Judas, and Peter experienced that temptation that he gave into, so he had that experience of making those decisions for personal advantage, and they knew it. And I know he was shaking his head. It's like, Ananias, you just don't go there. Just don't go there. I mean, in his brain saying that, and then boom, out of his mouth comes this. This I can see in your being that Satan has filled your heart because you are now going to lie. You're not lying to me. You're not lying to these people. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. God is the one you're lying to. You cannot, you cannot create this sense of personal advantage and being deceived and trying to deceive God's people and being divisive and carrying this. You just can't do this and say, now this is okay, this behavior is okay, God says it's okay. And not wanting that in his community, the Holy Spirit takes Ananias out. I believe it truly happened, understanding how a, civic, uh, a community is engineered and, gr- and grows, not that I'm a civic engineer, but just understanding the complexity of church life, how it only grows with the size of people you're trying to navigate. And God is, is making a statement, I will not tolerate this. You don't have to be part of this community, but you will not hurt my body this way. This huge, don't you dare mess with my church. Don't you dare do this to those who are truly loving others in my name, who want to care for them. And now Ananias, it's like if, if he was allowed to live, if this had happened, what hap- would, he, would he try something more? Would the next step be, well, you know, there's this. And, you know, Peter is okay. And I know he hung out with Jesus all the time. But look at me. I have this huge house. You know, if you come and follow me, and I will tell you who Jesus is, you can live in my palace for free. It won't be required. That all these things won't be needed. And what does that kind of sin not confronted? And that's where transparency and learning to live as a community. And yay, we love it when our church community confronts us with something that has caused harm in the body. And even though you don't agree with them, but your decision has had these echoes, and these people are hurt. And it's not everybody's favorite thing. I don't think it's anybody's favorite thing, but it's this is the base of it. If you don't deal with it, it just grows into a bigger, more evil thing. Sin has to be confronted. You have to talk about it. And it doesn't have to be public. 
this one was public, but there's other things. But you navigate. And so God is establishing this process for all of these people to see. Do not do this. And not only once, as they go and they bury him, it takes about three hours, because then we read in verse 7, there's an inter interval about three hours, and his wife, Sapphira, came in not knowing what had happened. How in the world could that be? Because it was three hours. Who didn't run to her house to tell her? Exactly. Mm -hmm. In this tight-knit community, yes. this is such a mind-boggling story. Yes. So mind-boggling, because she evidently mm -hmm. didn't find out. Unless she's hiding, people went there and she didn't answer the door. Or, oh, yeah. You know, I highly doubt it, though, because right. the way it sounds, she wouldn't have said what she said. Right. And so she comes and not knowing, not knowing, no idea what had happened. And Peter sees her. It's like, tell me, Sapphira, did you sell the field for the month that's in this bag? And she says, yes, for that price. <laughs> And then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? So we go from why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And why did you test the Spirit of the Lord? So Peter is outlining this idea that you're lying to God's Spirit, and then you're testing him to see if you can get away with sin. Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. So was this under the move of the Holy Spirit? I know it was anointed by the Spirit, but did that first thing come with the illumination of the Holy Spirit? Boom, and now you see this lady, and Peter's learned... Sapphira, you can't. God isn't going to tolerate this. He had three hours, three hours to think about, is she going to show? Why didn't he send for her? Why did they just wait? So I know, in my imagination, that group of 12, how could you not have conversations about what to do next? So when you study the apostles and you realize their personalities from what we can, from what is listed in biblical and extra-biblical sources, that they, these personalities are making these decisions. Even the lesser-known ones are here at the table making these decisions with these individuals. So I don't know what happened, how Peter said this, and what was in him and what was in his mind in the process. But he knew that she, if she is complicit in part of this, she is not going to be able to stay either, that God will get, get rid of her. Oh, that sounds horrible to say that, doesn't it? But it's crazy. Peter, in leadership, had to deal with this abuse, and this is abuse. They wanted to abuse the, the body of Christ for their own advantage. And instantly she dropped dead at his feet. The young men came in, they found her, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. So here they're buried somewhere outside of the community. And then it says in verse 11 here of chapter 5 in Acts, Then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard these things. You bet I can't it even imagine what that was like. Wow, watching that infilling of the Holy Spirit that they experienced just days before and watching that Holy Spirit watch over this community, much like the Holy Spirit watched over the nation of Israel as it left Egypt, these crazy weird miracles of protection and watching over and, and direction and, and safety and they're watching it happen, not with a pillar of cloud or a pillar of fire or these other miracles. They're watching it happen by the Holy Spirit working through individuals and empowering them and then doing these crazy things to remove evil out of their way so they could grow as a healthy community. I have to wonder what was the how, who did not sleep that night, <laughs> almost everyone in the community, how many people came and repented that night or the next day. Um, did they have a great big repentance service in the community? I mean, how could you not? Right. How could you not have... A, your own assessment after really, really reading through this story of history and that Peter had to lead through this type of abuse and make sure that the community is safe because that's their job is making sure this growing church community is a safe community mm -hmm. and watching the Holy Spirit step in and saying, I'm not dealing with this, not here. You can't bring this evil into this community. Their behavior risks the well-being of the whole. It reminds me very much, Pastor O, of the story, uh, the historical narrative of when David was looking to return the Ark of the Lord, and he was enthusiastic yes. about doing it, and yeah. it was on a cart, and the cart tipped, and uh, Uzziah reached out to steady it and was struck dead. Yes. The whole idea of you do not recognize the significance of what it is you just did. Yes. The fear of the Lord. 
the awe of the Lord. Yes. And um, you talk about the atmosphere changing after Ananias passed away, you know, struck dead right in that moment. It strikes me as, you know, here we go from this incredible high, weird yes. happening yes. of the Holy Spirit coming on this whole community and tongues and people getting born again, you know, hearing the truth of the word of God. And leading them right into this circumstance and in this moment. And I can only imagine that sense of, woo, stuff just got serious. Yes. That whole atmosphere changing. This is, a, this is bigger and more profound than we even understood. Yes. Woo. And, and that time frame of when, you know, David was frightened, angry at the Lord um, yes, yes. for how he broke out, yes. uh, quote yes. unquote, against uh, Uzziah, and it cost him his life. And, you know, David had to wrestle with coming to terms yes. with, okay, the relationship that I had with you, there's more going on with you than I understood. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're bigger even than I knew. Yes. And I need to learn to live with you now. Yes. And, and here's the church um, uh, and how faithful of the Holy Spirit at her beginning of yes. protecting yeah. yes. the church because clearly Ananias and Sapphira didn't understand the significance of what it was they were doing against the well-being Correct. Correct. and putting at risk this whole brand new baby burgeoning community. Yeah doing it in ignorance, quote unquote. Right. It's interesting to note, because when you read through the Old Testament and you see how God takes, I think there's about 70 people in the nation of Israel at this time, and he tucks them into the background of Egypt so they can be safe. But by the time they leave, they're over a million. Right. So there was that process of oversight and caring. Because you read stuff like this, and it's like, Lord, why don't you do this today? Because there's a lot of abuse. I mean, horrific abuse done in the name of Jesus, right. done, in, done in the churches. And it's hard to read. And there's a part of us that says, yes, Holy Spirit, just zap all that sin out and you would like to see that justice metered at the time. But you made an important point that this idea, this growing baby community, that it needs to be established and there's this specific type of protection, much like we've seen in the Old Testament of the nation of Israel. Because you're not going to have this special relationship with this nation if people obliterate it. So he tucked it back in to this corner of Egypt where they were safe and they grew into this amazing great big community with God's hand upon them. So here we see that same type of protection happening in this this growing community. And so this is where we we had to stop because we had to go home. And we'll pick up our journey through Acts with Peter when we get back together again in the next session. But here is where we stopped. And here is this idea of, all right, I, I really struggled. Not really. I just didn't want to stop on Ananias and Sapphira and send everybody home. But it was fun, even coming in this morning, the individuals making the comment, yeah, you should have been in the car and heard the conversation last night. This, this topic, we just can't quit... And that's what it did in my head. And so it was nice to have it be the last thing we talked about, the last experience of leadership we're looking at here in that one Wednesday night, because it really should, it should shake us. We weren't there, but now that we know this happened, and it happened as this idea of gaining personal advantage and lying to get that personal advantage, that is the same heart that's happening here. And if it's this big a deal here, oh, sweet Jesus, forgive us. Amen. Oh, sweet Jesus, for hiding behind the shield of Christianese or reputation or the shield of whatever, because I want what I want, and so I'm going to use this to get, because I can, you know, they're going to think I'm good, or they're going to... No, the Holy Spirit knows when you're lying and you're taking advantage of his people to get what makes you benefit but it hurts his body. Right. He, he knows that, and, and we do. We answer, and it even says in Scripture that you're held at a different level if you're in leadership in the Christian church and you do that, that in the end, specifically in, the eternity, in eternity, in supernatural life, you are going to answer for it. But I truly believe it does start showing up here in the physical as well. And I'm not talking about, you know, uh, Oh, I don't even want to go there because there's not enough time left in the podcast. I'm not talking about certain types of things. I'm just talking about where you can orchestrate chess pieces and hurt people and you get the glory or you get the commission or you get this or you get the benefit or you steal someone else's uh, 
practice and you say it's yours and it's like no this was my representation of things mm-hmm. like that so even those types of things when we gain a personal advantage and we lie and we hide and we deceive and we divide to get it we need to be afraid of the consequence that's what i think this example forces us and if you don't want to deal with it don't read acts chapter 5 it forces us in our human face to no you don't we know we would agree i mean obviously it is not something that there's no integrity that's not ethical to do that we know that but if you get away with it a little bit here and a little bit there and it feeds your being and you like that feeding and you don't want to make the sacrifice well anyways i can't because i didn't create that but i can say i did this and they actually took it for my inspiration or i deserve this look at me i did we do that as human beings very easily but it should frighten us from ever doing that and so here is my closing question as we and this exciting and interesting and mind-boggling, and I don't want to know this happened, but it did, healthy discussion is what price do I pay to have things my way? Thanks so much for joining us on this week's discussion on Chew on This, Who is This Man Peter? Called Who is This Man Called Peter? Week 4. Please join us and the whole Wednesday night crew at Maranatha's Forest Lake campus at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday evenings and enjoy this discussion live. Don't forget, you can check out our website, realchurch.org forward slash Wednesday night for all of Pastor Orlean's notes and references and feel free to share it with your friends. And today, wherever you find yourself, let's love God and love people. See you for the next episode of Chew on This.